It's hardly news that the newspaper business is on the ropes. Some papers have folded completely, others have reduced the number of pages, virtually an entire industry in free fall, due mainly to easy access to the web, offering news practically as it happens. The most recent casualty is the New Orleans Times Picayune, an institution that's seen the city through good times and the worst of times, a part of the very fabric of a unique American city. Last October, the Times Picayune began publishing only three days a week, making New Orleans the largest American city without a daily paper. Advanced publications owned by the Newhouse family decided on major surgery for the paper before the economics of publishing killed it outright. We visited New Orleans just prior to the amputation. There's no doubt New Orleans is a city like no other. A wonderful ethnic cocktail, a place that dances to its own rhythm, and a town devoted to its traditions, like the Times Picayune, the legendary newspaper that had published every single day in New Orleans for 175 years. The tradition of waking up in the morning and breaking that cup of coffee and opening up that paper, it seems to be going by the wayside. When you take away a venerable institution like the Times Picking Union, you really kind of take away a piece of the soul of a city. When Mitch Landrew, the mayor of New Orleans, says the loss of a daily paper is a terrible blow to a city that has had more than its fair share of misfortune. People in the city were worried that it was going to send a message to the rest of the country that we want a big league city because we're not going to have a daily paper. But the facts of life are that newspapers are folding all over the country. It's a dying business. It may be, but that doesn't mean that people have to like it. New Orleanians may be outraged that the paper now publishes only three days a week, but they still start those days with their coffee and beignets and their times pick. Established in 1837, it was called the Picayune because that's how much it cost. One Picayune, an old Spanish coin. The paper became a civic watchdog, a nemesis of corrupt politicians like Huey Long. Classic American writers like O. Henry and William Faulkner wrote for the paper. It won several Pulitzer Prizes, most recently for its reporting of Hurricane Katrina. It has a central role that newsmen like me dream of, and it's hard to not have a crush on it. David Carr, a reporter who covers all things media for the New York Times, says the Times Picayune was one of the few things that worked in a city that generally doesn't. Schools aren't great. Public housing doesn't go very well. They have problems with their police. They've always had a really good newspaper. If it works, how come it's going under? Delivering a newspaper, like making it thump on your doorstep, it's a really hard business. It's an expensive business. What the new houses did is said, you know what, this only really works three days a week. So let's cut to those three days. That's when it pays. As sad as it is to witness local newspapers die or slowly disappear, technology and the economic facts are inescapable. The lumbering and expensive process of rolls of newsprint being fed into gigantic presses that spew out tons of newspapers which must be loaded onto trucks that drive into the night to ultimately deliver the paper to doorsteps, diners, and newsstands. It seems almost quaint when you consider that the same news, only fresher, can be dispatched at the speed of light to millions at a fraction of the cost. And yet, the Times Picayune still showed a profit. I think that the Times Picayune was making money, but the trend lines for all of Newhouse's newspapers, including the Times Picayune, was down eight to 10% every single year. So it's sort of an existential threat. So Steve Newhouse, chairman of the company's digital arm, announced a massive restructuring to build a viable future for the paper. The focus would shift to the paper's 24-hour website, a print edition would be published only Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. More than 200 people would lose their jobs, press operators, copy editors, photographers, and distinguished senior reporters. The changes were called painful, but inevitable. 
Steve Newhouse declined to be interviewed. He referred us to Jim Amos, the highly respected longtime editor of the paper. Did you agree with the decision to start publishing only three days a week? Well, we've been grappling, as all metro newspapers in this country have, with what's happening to our industry. And that is um, a steady decline in, in circulation, a steady decline in print ad revenue. And um, the solutions, uh, there aren't many. Uh, one is to act as though nothing were happening and continue business as usual. To me, that's presiding over a gradual irrelevancy and, and a gradual death. What you're saying is that the patient was dying and the only way to save it was to cut off all four limbs and replace it with an artificial one. The patient, and by that uh, I would say the, the national patient, has been uh, in a lingering illness for a very long time. And some of the doctors are standing by and wringing their hands. Um, and some are walking away and saying, this is an incurable illness. And uh, others are actually trying um, operations that have a good chance of, of succeeding. The company is hoping that by reducing the number of publishing days at many of its 35 regional newspapers, it will drive readers to their websites. They are determined, determined to transform these newspapers into digital franchises. But if you think of most newspapers are in the emergency room, right? They're all wounded one way or another. And you pick the Times-Picayune, one of, really one of the stronger papers in America, and say, ah, oh, we'll do major surgery on that one. Seems odd. Did they anticipate the kind of outrage that the announcement produced? They knew they were gonna get some blowback. I don't, I don't think they expected the gale force winds, the hurricane winds that, came at them. I mean, people were frantic. Advertisers declared their objections. Rallies were held for fired employees, and Save the Picayune posters sprung up throughout the town. The city council passed a resolution urging the owners to continue printing daily. And an open letter was published where local worthies warned that the new houses were losing the trust of the community. If the new houses have given up on New Orleans, as they have, why not just sell it? Don't hold us hostage. Ann Milling, a local philanthropist, is one of several prominent New Orleanians who supported the protest. She was joined by Gregory Amont, Archbishop of New Orleans, and Lolas Eli, a writer and former Times Picayune columnist. Why this outrage over a newspaper cutting back? Part of what happened, particularly after Katrina, was a sense of community. And the Times Picayune was a big part of that. The paper published literally through hell and high water. Dozens of reporters kept the world informed about what was happening while even their own homes were flooded. In the aftermath, the paper became a beacon of civic solidarity. We've recovered a great deal, but we still have a long way to go. There are serious issues before us that we need that daily watchdog voice. Archbishop, this has more to do with mammon than with God. How come you got <laughs> so deeply involved in it? I got deeply involved because I'm from New Orleans. I was born and raised here. I have a great love for uh, the people in the city and our tradition. But besides that, I really am concerned about the elderly and the poor. This puts them in a very disadvantaged position. The reduced paper was portrayed as a bold step into the digital future. But New Orleans is one of the least wired cities in the country, with more than a third of the city without internet access. That's huge in terms of the population of this community. And you can say, oh, well, maybe these people don't read the newspaper, but I can promise you, you can see people, black, white, young, old, Hispanic, Vietnamese, buying newspapers at drugstores, grocery stores, sitting at coffee shops. People read the Times-Picayune. Well, I think what the, the suggestion is that the future looked very bleak for the paper, and like any business, they got to look ahead. But one of the puzzling things for me is that we know that there are others, specifically Mr. Tom Benson, who was willing to buy the paper. Tom Benson, a local billionaire, owner of the New Orleans Saints football team, offered to buy the paper to keep it printing daily. He was told the paper was not for sale. If someone is foolish enough to want to buy a newspaper, and you're in the business of showing a profit, you'd think you would jump at the offer. 
Well, I think our owners are also in the business of newspapering and journalism and care about the preservation of the news report that we are going to be able to deliver in this town. I know that sounds terribly altruistic, but um, I, I, I've just seen so much evidence of that being the case. Did you expect that this decision would be made with such outrage? Well, I, I'm, I'm a product of this community. This is my hometown. Uh, I think I know it well, and um, I, I understand the sadness, I understand the anger, and we all have something in common, and that is that we're, we're driven by a passion for this city. Lola's Eli, the former columnist, has the passion, but doesn't believe the abbreviated paper will satisfy it. How can half as many people cover the same amount of news with half as many resources? You fear for the quality of the journalism. Though the owners promised an improved website and created new jobs to service it, Eli says it's geared towards fun and games rather than watchdog journalism. Do you feel that a newspaper online is a toothless watchdog? It's not the same if, if I call you and I say, Morley, I'm going to put this story online two weeks from now or you know, three days from now. It's not the same thing. There's no law of nature that says that that kind of journalism is inextricably linked to ink on paper. We fully intend to continue to produce the kind of public trust journalism for which they know us. New Orleans is a kind of reporter's delight, yeah. you'd have to well, admit. Of course it is. Yes? Yeah, I mean, we tell uh, good stories down here. <laughs> we tell good stories. And, and <laughs> oh, we make good stories. There's a lot of hanky-panky goes on. Yes, sir. Do you think that the city and state are going to suffer because the watchdog isn't on watch in quite the same way? Right. I hope not. The more robust press we have, the better everybody is. So I'm hoping that that is not going to suffer. The great steel presses of the Times, Picayune, are mostly silent now, reduced to working less than half the time. The question is, will it become less than half of what it once was? And there are rumblings that an even larger Newhouse newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, founded in 1842 and with a circulation close to 300,000, could soon be next. Newspaper industry in state of decline, not exactly a stop the press's headline. For two decades now, owing largely to the loss of advertising revenue to Facebook and Google, fewer and fewer Americans get their news, comics, and sports from all those gazettes and tribunes and journals. But that doesn't tell the whole story. As we first reported in February, there is an additional threat. Hedge funds and other financial firms that own nearly a third of the daily newspapers in America. And these new owners are often committed not to headlines and deadlines, but to bottom lines. One fund in particular has been called by some in the industry a vulture, bleeding newspapers dry. It all prompts the question, as local newsrooms and local news coverage shrivel up, to what extent does democracy shrink with it? Behind the marching band and baton twirlers at the annual 4th of July parade in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, you'll find a one-man band. Reporter Evan Brandt, snapping photos, taking notes, and gathering quotes. The paper comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow. Every day. Tell me all about what you're doing here. We're just looking forward to a great 4th of July. For the last 24 years, he's chronicled this community of 23,000 for the local newspaper, The Mercury. J-A-S. Which at one time had dozens of reporters. Now, Brandt is literally oh, the last reporter standing in Pottstown. When a community like this loses their local reporters, what else are they losing? It reminds us all about shared experiences. You know who died. You know who graduated from high school. You know whose kid had a great game. Um, you know, those are all important elements about holding people together. You're describing the soul of a community. Sure. Brandt took us to the old headquarters of the Mercury. Punching above its weight, the Mercury won a Pulitzer Prize in 1979 and another in 1990. Now it looks like this. My desk was right about here, 
and the editor sat up there. The sports guys were along here, the photographers were in the back. Anyone could walk in the front door and say, I need to talk to a reporter. My sewer's backing up and the township isn't doing anything about it. Can you do something? Behold, the new Mercury headquarters. We're going up to the Mercury newsroom. Brantz turned his attic into a command center. There's where the magic happens. It's here that he scrambles to cover Pottstown, 20 surrounding towns, and nine different school districts. Overworked and overwhelmed, Brandt has seen his industry battered by all sorts of forces. Disappearing classified ads, people getting news for free online. But he says the worst culprit is the hedge fund Alden Global Capital, which bought the Mercury in 2011 and has since sold the paper's building and slashed newsroom staff by about 70 percent. Severe even by the standards of the newspaper sector that has seen an astounding 57 percent job loss since 2008. In 2017, after another round of layoffs, Brandt says he felt angry and wanted answers and accountability. So he paid a visit to the Hampton summer home of Heath Freeman, the 41-year-old president of Alden Global Capital, and knocked on the door. What did you want to say to him? What I settled on is, what value do you place on local news? And I'm not talking about money. What value do you place on it? Brandt recalls that a woman let him in. Behind her, he caught a glimpse of Freeman, who walked away. You never got to ask him that question. I did not. This secretive hedge fund, their website shows this single photo, started building its print empire over the last decade and now owns more than 200 newspapers, making it the country's second largest newspaper owner behind Gannett. Alden's rapid takeover and cuts have alarmed U.S. lawmakers. In 2019, 21 senators wrote to Heath Freeman, asking him to abandon his newspaper-killing business model. Freeman, though, has doubled down. Last year, Alden made a play for Tribune Publishing, home to historic papers like the Baltimore Sun and the Chicago Tribune. This is an attack on our democracy. Gary Marks and David Jackson spent 30 years as investigative reporters at the Chicago Tribune, a paper that has won 27 Pulitzer Prizes. Local and regional newspapers are so important to our communities, to holding our leaders accountable. They're not just going after some business that is trying to make money. They admit the Tribune had been crippled for years by bad management. But after seeing Alden buy the Denver Post and then gut staff by 70 percent, the journalists were worried the hedge fund would do irreversible damage. So what did you do? We fought back. That's what we did. Dave and I just decided that we are going to throw everything we possibly can, use all our investigative and repertorial skills to save this organization that is so important, we felt, to the future of the city we love, Chicago. Okay. So this investigative team, accustomed to exposing corruption and injustice, acting as watchdogs on local government, they turn their attention to their potential new owners. You've said when Alden Capital arrived, it was an existential threat. Why no. is this firm particularly nefarious? Well, Alden has sort of a playbook of going into a distressed newsroom and selling off the real estate and property, equipment, things like that. And second of all, diminishing the resources that the reporters have. Leaked company financials show in 2017 Alden built in profit margins as high as 30 percent at certain papers, more than double industry standard. In recent filings, the New York Times company reported 10 percent profit margins. These are uh, executives from a hedge fund who live in a very uh, wealthy lifestyle. They're not taking the profits and uh, using them to build the Tribune. What's your response to someone who'd say, look, this is capitalism? Well, we've always been aware that we're doing journalism in uh, a capitalist democracy, and we've always embraced that. But we felt that Alden didn't recognize the civic trust that's embedded in this profit-making machine. Jackson and Mark say what they learned about Alden only fueled their sense of urgency. So in 2020, putting their jobs at risk, they wrote an op-ed in the New York Times pleading for a philanthropist, foundation, anyone to step forward to save their paper. One man tried, Maryland hotel magnate Stuart Bainham, a lifelong subscriber to the Baltimore Sun. 
Bainham committed $200 million, and we followed him last year scrambling to put together a deal to buy Tribune Publishing. We've done the due diligence, we just need a buyer. Bainham couldn't find a partner. Last year, Alden bought Tribune Publishing for more than $600 million, and two days later started offering buyouts to Tribune employees. More than 40 have since left the Chicago Tribune, including one-fourth of the newsroom. Freeman declined our repeated request to sit down with 60 Minutes, but his public relations team sent us letters he wrote to other newspaper owners that state Alden is committed to providing robust, independently-minded local journalism and that it's time for tech giants to start paying for the billions of dollars they're making off of news publishers' content. The newspaper crisis didn't begin with Alden, and this is not the only financial firm in this sector. But Alden is often held up as the worst actor. One study conducted by the University of North Carolina in 2018 found that some Alden-owned newspapers had cut staff at twice the rate of their competitors. Stephen Waldman is a former journalist. In 2011, he studied the decline of the local news industry for the Federal Communications Commission. He says that in the absence of local reporting, there's evidence of increased corruption by local officials. One example he points to, Bell, California. When the local newspaper there shut down, scandal ensued. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you very much. The elected officials just kept voting themselves pay raises to the point where the city manager was making $800,000 just because there was no one there. I'm guessing there's nothing specifically corrupt about Bell, California that wouldn't replicate in any of a thousand other towns. Pretty much through all of human history and throughout the world, when you have power that isn't watched, it tends to get abused. Waldman says it's not just that local news has been hollowed out, it's what has replaced it. The vacuum was filled by national cable news and social media and very uh, opinionated, polarizing material. Waldman believes in flooding communities with local reporters. In 2017, he co-founded Report for America, a program that sends print, radio, and television journalists to newsrooms in underserved communities across the country. We brought together five reporters. I'm Chrisanna Mink. I'm a pediatrician and also a health reporter. I'm Camelot Todd. I report on mental health for Buffalo. I'm Amelia Farrell Nicely. I'm an investigative reporter that covers poverty in West Virginia. Chris Jones, a Marine Corps veteran, covers domestic extremism in Appalachia. Grayson Doctor covers race and equity in Charlotte. These studies that show that people trust local media more than national media, doesn't sound like that surprised you, those results. <laughs> no. <laughs> and these are our neighbors, you know? I mean, we're not writing about someone I'm never going to talk to again. And they're people before they're interview subjects. This is Jones on January 6th. He had cultivated such a level of trust from his sources that he was one of the few reporters covering the insurrectionists as they stormed the U.S. Capitol. I got a lot of calls immediately after the 6th from a lot of different, like, news organizations, people who wouldn't answer an email from me, you know, a week prior. You were the local journal. You had the sources. You had the relationships. A lot of national media is coastal, and it stays coastal unless there's a big news event, and then they fly their reporters in. Write the story and fly him out. Grayson Doctor experienced this firsthand. Her mother was one of nine African Americans killed by a white supremacist in the 2015 Mother Emanuel Church shooting in Charleston. Doctor felt that when the national media parachuted in, they were looking for sound bites instead of examining the deeper questions. Especially in a place like Charleston, South Carolina, where like the history of racism runs very, very deep. That was the opportunity to really dive into some of that history, you know, like, why did this happen in this community? While newspapers like the Washington Post and L.A. Times have been bought by billionaires, Waltman says addressing this crisis falls to all of us. We need a dramatic increase in the the commitment of foundations and philanthropists and donors like you and me to actually supporting local news. Remember Stuart Bainham, who lost out to Alden Global Capital? He's launching the Baltimore Banner, a nonprofit digital news outlet to go head-to-head with the Baltimore Sun for subscribers. It will cover only local news, with plans over the next three years to hire more than 100 reporters. All digital. The web, newsletters, podcasts, apps, wherever people receive their news, we're going to go there. 
After sounding the alarm about Alden Global Capital, Gary Marks and David Jackson left the Chicago Tribune. Jackson is still working as a reporter at a nonprofit newsroom in Chicago. Full speed, full speed. Marks is now living what he calls his second dream job as a high school football coach. Come on, Teddy. They're more convinced than ever that local news cannot become yesterday's news. You're faster than that. Journalism is one of the most noble professions there is. You can have tremendous impact on society. I work with a lot of young people, and I tell them that the uh, we're leaving them a, a smashed and broken system, but that they're going to have to reinvent it because it's necessary. Journalism is necessary for the survival of American democracy. As for Heath Freeman, this past summer, he bought a Miami mansion for $19 million, a transaction discovered and reported by a local news outlet. Her name is Frances Haugen. That is a fact that Facebook has been anxious to know since last month when an anonymous former employee filed complaints with federal law enforcement. The complaints say Facebook's own research shows that it amplifies hate, misinformation, and political unrest, but the company hides what it knows. One complaint alleges that Facebook's Instagram harms teenage girls. What makes Haugen's complaints unprecedented is the trove of private Facebook research she took when she quit in May. The documents appeared first last month in the Wall Street Journal, but tonight, Frances Haugen is revealing her identity to explain why she became the Facebook whistleblower. The thing I saw at Facebook over and over again was there were conflicts of interest between what was good for the public and what was good for Facebook. And Facebook over and over again chose to optimize for its own interests, like making more money. Frances Haugen is 37, a data scientist from Iowa, with a degree in computer engineering and a Harvard master's degree in business. For 15 years, she's worked for companies including Google and Pinterest. I've seen a bunch of social networks and it was substantially worse at Facebook than anything I'd seen before. You know, someone else might have just quit and moved on. And I wonder why you take this stand. Imagine you know what's going on inside of Facebook and you know no one on the outside knows. I knew what my future looked like if I continued to stay inside of Facebook, which is person after person after person has tackled this inside of Facebook and ground themselves to the ground. When and how did it occur to you to take all of these documents out of the company? At some point in 2021, I realized, okay, I'm gonna have to do this in a systemic way, and I have to get out enough that no one can question that this is real. She secretly copied tens of thousands of pages of Facebook internal research. She says evidence shows that the company is lying to the public about making significant progress against hate, violence, and misinformation. One study she found from this year says, we estimate that we may action as little as three to five percent of hate and about six tenths of one percent of violence and incitement on Facebook, despite being the best in the world at it. To quote from another one of the documents you brought out, we have evidence from a variety of sources that hate speech, divisive political speech, and misinformation on Facebook and the family of apps are affecting societies around the world. When we live in an information environment that is full of angry, hateful, polarizing content, it erodes our civic trust, it erodes our faith in each other, it erodes our ability to want to care for each other. The version of Facebook that exists today is tearing our societies apart and causing ethnic violence around the world. Ethnic violence, including Myanmar in 2018, when the military used Facebook to launch a genocide. Uh, the first quarter of 2019. Frances Haugen told us she was recruited by Facebook in 2019. She says she agreed to take the job only if she could work against misinformation because she had lost a friend to online conspiracy theories. I never wanted anyone to feel the pain that I had felt. And I had seen how 
high the stakes were in terms of making sure there was high quality information on Facebook. At headquarters, she was assigned to Civic Integrity, which worked on risks to elections, including misinformation. But after this past election, there was a turning point. They told us, we're dissolving Civic Integrity. Like, they basically said, oh, good, we, we made it through the election. There wasn't riots. We can get rid of Civic Integrity now. Fast forward a couple of months, we got the insurrection. And when they got rid of Civic Integrity, it was the moment where I was like, I don't trust that they're willing to actually invest what needs to be invested to keep Facebook from being dangerous. Facebook says the work of civic integrity was distributed to other units. Haugen told us the root of Facebook's problem is in a change that it made in 2018 to its algorithms, the programming that decides what you see on your Facebook news feed. So, you know, you have your phone, you might see only 100 pieces of content if you sit and scroll off for, you know, five minutes. But Facebook has thousands of options it could show you. The algorithm picks from those options based on the kind of content you've engaged with the most in the past. And one of the consequences of how Facebook is picking out that content today is it is optimizing for content that gets engagement or reaction. But its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, it's easier to inspire people to anger than it is to other emotions. Misinformation, angry content yeah. is enticing to people it's and keep, keeps them on the platform. Yes. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Haugen says Facebook understood the danger to the 2020 election, so it turned on safety systems to reduce misinformation. But many of those changes, she says, were temporary. And as soon as the election was over, they turned them back off, or they changed the settings back to what they were before to prioritize growth over safety. And that really feels like a betrayal of democracy to me. Facebook says some of the safety systems remained. But after the election, Facebook was used by some to organize the January 6th insurrection. Prosecutors cite Facebook posts as evidence, photos of armed partisans, and text including, by bullet or ballot, restoration of the republic is coming. Extremists used many platforms, but Facebook is a recurring theme. After the attack, Facebook employees raged on an internal message board copied by Haugen. Haven't we had enough time to figure out how to manage discourse without enabling violence? We looked for positive comments and found this. I don't think our leadership team ignores data, ignores dissent, ignores truth. But that drew this reply. Welcome to Facebook. I see you just joined in November 2020. We have been watching wishy-washy actions of company leadership for years now. Colleagues cannot conscience working for a company that does not do more to mitigate the negative effects of its platform. Facebook essentially amplifies the worst of human nature. It's one of these unfortunate consequences, right? No one at Facebook is malevolent, but the incentives are misaligned, right? Like Facebook makes more money when you consume more content. People enjoy engaging with things that elicit an emotional reaction. And the more anger that they get exposed to, the more they interact and more they consume. That dynamic led to a complaint to Facebook by major political parties across Europe. This 2019 internal report obtained by Haugen says that the parties feel strongly that the change to the algorithm has forced them to skew negative in their communications on Facebook, leading them into more extreme policy positions. The European political parties were essentially yeah. saying to Facebook, the way you've written your algorithm is changing the way we lead our countries. Yes. You are forcing us to take positions that we don't like, that we know are bad for society. We know if we don't take those positions, we won't win in the marketplace of social media. Evidence of harm, she says, extends to Facebook's Instagram app. 
One of the Facebook internal studies that you found talks about how Instagram harms teenage girls. Oh, yeah. One study says 13.5% of teen girls say Instagram makes thoughts of suicide worse. 17% of teen girls say Instagram makes eating disorders worse. And what's super tragic is Facebook's own research says, as these young women begin to consume this eating disorder content, they get more and more depressed, and it actually makes them use the app more. And so they end up in this feedback cycle where they hate their bodies more and more. Facebook's own research says, it is not just that Instagram is dangerous for teenagers, that it harms teenagers, it's that it is distinctly worse than other forms of social media. Facebook said just last week, it would postpone plans to create an Instagram for younger children. Last month, Haugen's lawyers filed at least eight complaints with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which enforces the law in financial markets. The complaints compare the internal research with the company's public face, often that of CEO Mark Zuckerberg, here testifying remotely to Congress last March. We remove content that could lead to imminent real-world harm. We've built an unprecedented third-party fact-checking program. The system isn't perfect, but it's the best approach that we've found to address misinformation in line with our country's values. One of Francis Haugen's lawyers is John Tai. He's the founder of a Washington legal group called Whistleblower Aid. What is the legal theory? behind going to the SEC. What laws are you alleging have been broken? As a publicly traded company, Facebook is required to not lie to its investors or even withhold material information. So the SEC regularly brings enforcement actions alleging that companies like Facebook and others are making material misstatements and omissions that affect investors adversely. One of the things that Facebook might allege is that she stole company documents. The Dodd-Frank Act passed over 10 years ago at this point, created uh, an office of the whistleblower inside the SEC. And one of the provisions of that law says that no company can prohibit its employees from, from communicating with the SEC and sharing internal corporate documents with the SEC. I have a lot of empathy for Mark. And Mark has never set out to make a hateful platform, but he has allowed choices to be made where the side effects of those choices are that hateful polarizing content gets more distribution, more reach. Facebook declined an interview, but in a written statement to 60 Minutes, it said, every day our teams have to balance protecting the right of billions of people to express themselves openly with the need to keep our platform a safe and positive place. We continue to make significant improvements to tackle the spread of misinformation and harmful content. To suggest we encourage bad content and do nothing is just not true. If any research had identified an exact solution to these complex challenges, the tech industry, governments, and society would have solved them a long time ago. Facebook is a $1 trillion company. Just 17 years old, it has 2.8 billion users, which is 60% of all internet-connected people on Earth. Frances Haugen plans to testify before Congress this week. She believes the federal government should impose regulations. Facebook has demonstrated they cannot act independently. Facebook over and over again has shown it chooses profit over safety. It is subsidizing, it is paying for its profits with our safety. I'm hoping that this will have had a big enough impact on the world that they get the fortitude and the motivation to actually go put those regulations into place. That's my hope. As big tech firms wrestle with how to keep false and harmful information off their social networks, the Supreme Court is wrestling with whether platforms like Facebook and Twitter, now called X, have the right to decide what users can say on their sites. The dispute centers on a pair of laws passed in the red states of Florida and Texas 
over the question of First Amendment rights on the Internet. The Supreme Court is considering whether the platforms are like newspapers, which have free speech rights to make their own editorial decisions, or if they're more like telephone companies that merely transmit everyone's speech. If the laws are upheld, the platforms could be forced to carry hate speech and false medical information, the very content most big tech companies have spent years trying to remove through teams of content moderators. But in the process, conservatives claim that the companies have engaged in a conspiracy to suppress their speech. As in this case, a tweet in 2022 from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene falsely claiming that there were extremely high amounts of COVID vaccine deaths. I have not misled anyone. I have not put out misinformation. Twitter eventually banned Greene's personal account for multiple violations of its COVID policy. Facebook and YouTube also removed or labeled posts they deemed misinformation. Big tech's out to get conservatives. That's not a suspicion. That's not a hunch. That's a fact. Confronted with criticisms from conservatives like Congressman Jim Jordan that the social media companies were censoring their views and because of cost cutting, platforms began downsizing their fact-checking teams. So today, social media is teeming with misinformation, like these posts suggesting tanks are moving across the Texas-Mexico border. But it's actually footage from Chile. These are AI-generated images of, well, see for yourself. With social media moderation teams shrinking, a new target is misinformation academic researchers, who began working closely with the platforms after evidence of Russian interference online in the 2016 election. Are researchers being chilled? Absolutely. Kate Starbird is a professor at the University of Washington, a former professional basketball player, and a leader of a misinformation research group created ahead of the 2020 election. We were very specifically looking at misinformation about election processes, procedures, and election results. And if we saw something about that, we would pass it along to the platforms if we thought it violated their, one of their policies. Here's an example, a November 2020 tweet saying that election software in Michigan switched 6,000 votes from Trump to Biden. The researchers alerted Twitter that then decided to label it with a warning. I understand that some of the researchers, including you, have uh, had some threats against them, death threats. I have received one. Sometimes there are threats with something behind them, and sometimes they're just there to make you nervous and uncomfortable, and it's hard to know the difference. This campaign against you is meant to discredit you, so we won't believe you. Absolutely. And it's interesting that the people that pushed Voter fraud lies are some of the same people that are trying to discredit researchers that are trying to understand the problem. Did your research find that there was more misinformation spread by conservatives? Absolutely. I think not just our research, research across the board looking at the 2020 election mm -hmm. found that there was more misinformation spread by people that were supporters of Donald Trump or conservatives. And the events of January 6 kind of underscore this. USA! USA! The folks climbing up the Capitol building were supporters of, of Donald Trump, and they were, they were misinformed by these false claims, and, and that motivated those actions. This is wrong. We know it's wrong, and it's about protecting the First Amendment. Ohio Republican Congressman Jim Jordan is chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. So how big a problem is mis- and disinformation on the web? Well, I'm sure there's some, but I think, you know, our concern is the bigger problem of the, um, the attack on First Amendment liberties. Congressman Jordan's Judiciary Committee produced a report that concluded there's a censorship industrial complex where the federal government and tech companies colluded with academic researchers to disproportionately silence conservatives, which Kate Starbird vigorously denies. 
But Congressman Jordan says her group unfairly flagged posts like this tweet by Newt Gingrich. Pennsylvania Democrats are methodically changing the rules so they can steal the election. What I care about is the ability to speak and to speak in a political fashion and not have the government come after you for doing so. He complains that government officials put pressure on social media companies directly. A, a great example, 36 hours into the Biden administration, the, the Biden White House sends a uh, email to Twitter and says, we think you should take down this tweet ASAP. Just a call alone from the government, he says, can be unnerving. You can't have the government say, hey, we want you to do X, government who has the ability to regulate these private companies, government which has the ability to tax these private companies. He says that White House email to Twitter involved a tweet from... Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and everything in the tweet was true. That tweet implied falsely that baseball legend Hank Aaron's death was caused by the COVID vaccine. Did they take the it highest? down? Turned out they didn't, thank goodness. And but that post is still down. up. Kate Starbird says the social media platforms also often ignored the researchers' suggestions. The statistics I've seen are just for the Twitter platform, but I, my understanding is, is that they responded to about 30% of the things that we sent them. And I think the, on the majority of those, they put labels. But just a third. But just a third, yeah. And do you suspect that Facebook was the same? Oh, um, and yeah. These platforms have their own First Amendment rights. Katie Harbeth spent a decade at Facebook, where she helped develop its policies around election misinformation. When she was there, she says it was not unusual for the government to ask Facebook to remove content, which is proper as long as the government is not coercing. Conservatives are alleging that the platforms were taking down content at the behest of the government which is not true. The platforms made their own decisions, and many times we were pushing back on the government. Can we talk about a specific case? It's of Nancy Pelosi, it's a doctored tape, where she's, uh, she looks drunk. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic. This was the video of then House Speaker Pelosi, posted to Facebook in 2019, slowed down to make it seem that she was slurring her words. Did it come down? It did not. Why? Because it didn't violate the policies that they had. So did she put pressure on the company to take it down? She was definitely not pleased. She definitely <laughs> wanted yes? the company, yes. And it really damaged the relationship that the company had with her. The conservatives' campaign faced a setback at the Supreme Court on Monday when a majority of the justices seemed poised to reject their effort to limit attempts by the government to influence social media. The court is deciding in separate cases whether the platforms are like news organizations with a First Amendment right to control who and what information appears on their sites. Congressman Jordan argues that the tech companies shouldn't remove most of what they call misinformation. I think you let the American people respect the American people, their common sense, to figure out what's accurate, what isn't. Well, what about this idea that they, the 2020 election was stolen? You think that these companies should allow people to say that? And individuals can make up their own mind and that there should be... I think be the American people are smart. Look, look uh, I, I've not said that. What I've said is there were concerns about the 2020 election. I think Americans agree with that. No, they Let's, don't. You don't think they think there were concerns with the 2020 election? But Most also, people don't concerns. don't question the result. That's all I'm saying. They don't question okay, whether enough. Biden won or not. Right? Right. Pe most people don't oh, question okay. the no. outcome. Right. X basically did what Jordan proposes. After Elon Musk took over in 2022, most of its fact checkers were fired. Now the site is rife with trash talk and lies. Little would you know that this, said to be footage from Gaza, is really from a video game. Eventually, X users added a warning label. In this post, pictures of real babies killed in Israeli strikes are falsely dismissed as dolls. 
the toothpaste is out of the tube, and we have to figure out how to deal with the resulting mess. Daryl West, a senior fellow of technology innovation at the Brookings Institution, says the clash over what is true is fraying our institutions and threatening democracies around the world. Half of the world is voting uh, this year, and the world could stick with democracy or move towards authoritarianism. The danger is disinformation could decide the elections in a number of different countries. In the U.S., he says, the right wing has been flooding the Internet with reams of misleading information in order to confuse the public. And he's alarmed by the campaign to silence the academic researchers who have had to spend money and time on demands from Jim Jordan's Judiciary Committee. There are people who make the accusation that going after these researchers, misinformation researchers, is tantamount to harassment, and that your goal really is to chill the research. I, I find that, the, that it interesting you use the word chill because, in, in effect, what they're doing is chilling First Amendment free speech rights. When, when they're working in an effort to censor Americans, that's a chilling impact on speech. They say what you're doing, they do is a violation of their First Amendment rights. So right? us pointing out, us doing our constitutional duty of oversight of the executive branch, and somehow <laughs> we're censoring, that makes no sense to me. We, Americans, we're looking at the same thing and seeing a different truth. Well, you might see different things. I don't, I don't think you can see the different truth because truth is truth. Okay, the, the researchers say they're being chilled. That's their truth. Yeah. You're saying they're not. So. What's the truth? They can do their research. God bless them, do all the research you want. Don't use, don't, don't say, uh, we're, we're, we think this particular tweet is not true uh, and are, are. Well, that's their First Amendment they're, right they're, to they're, say they're, that. You, well, they can say it, but they can't take it down. Well, they can take it down and they don't. They just send their information to the companies. But when they're coordinating with government, that's a different animal. Okay. Well, of course, they deny they're coordinating. They're we just went round yeah, we and round. I wonder if there's a way to like measure the shifting meaning of misinformation. Starbird says she and her team feel intimidated by the conservatives' campaign. So while they will continue releasing their research reports on misinformation, they will no longer send their findings to the social media platforms. 